how many of you have spent more than a stopover or three days in Singapore? Can I see just a show of hands? Oh, fantastic. Okay, so you are familiar with Singapore? Good morning. I'm Ivan Heng from uh, Wild Rice, and we were here with a show last week called Hotel, which we absolutely love doing uh, and sharing the experience with you in Adelaide, with the audiences in Adelaide. Singapore is an island, city, nation, state. It is one-fifth the size of Adelaide. It has four times its population. With 5.5 million people living, loving, and existing there, it is one of the most densely populated countries in the world. Although we have four official races, one of which the authorities have decided to name other, <laughs> Chinese, Malay, Indian, and others, um, it is an immigrant nation and a home to more than 105 nationalities at any time. It's been ruled by one dominant political party for 53 years, whilst Australia has had four prime ministers in the last five years. <laughs> Singapore has had three in the last 53 years. We are one of the world's smallest but richest countries, but we have absolutely no natural resources. And that includes water, which we have to buy from our nearest and dearest neighbor, Malaysia. Our wealth is very much dependent on the global economy and predicated on attracting foreign business and foreign workers. So we are vulnerable in many ways. And as governments are wont to do, with the best of intentions, we want to ensure that there is stability and we want to preserve the status quo. Things are, of course, not ideal because we've had that one party in government with little or no opposition, no freedom of the press. We rank 151st, 151 out of 180 below Russia, I think. Um, we have a, quite a politically apathetic citizenry. Our people are obsessed and divided by race, and we still have Section 377A on our law books, which criminalizes homosexuals like me. The Media Development Authority prohibits the promotion and glamorization of the homosexual lifestyle, and we have a growing religious fundamentalism, which does not help. We also have a growing gap between the rich and the poor, the young and the old, and a growing resentment towards new immigrants and foreigners. And before we arrived here in Australia, I signed a clause with the National Arts Council to say that I would not do anything to disparage or denigrate the reputation of Singapore or the government. All this is fodder for theatre. <laughs> we founded Wild Rice in 2000 to tell our stories because the theatre is the place for people to gather, to tell our stories and to listen to our stories. The name is called Wild Rice and many of you have asked, so wild is because Singapore is anything but. We are tame and quite neutered. And rice is a staple. Um, it is not a nice to have like dessert. It is a need to have for nourishment and sustenance for, daily, for our daily lives. We set out to entertain, to inspire and challenge our audiences. And by entertain, we like this word entertain because I like to go back to this whole idea of uh, the French um, an archaic word in French, which is entreteur, which means to hold together. 
And um, good works, I believe, can really begin to hold an audience together, which arrives as strangers and leaves as a community. On average, we reach out to 40 to 50,000 members of the public from all walks of life and at all ages, from 5 to 85. But over the years, Wild Rice has developed a reputation. Our funding has been cut quite a few times, but we have developed a reputation to become a forum and a town hall for people to come together to reflect on the problems and possibilities of our times, to celebrate and investigate our diversity, to negotiate difference, to identify injustice, to mourn great losses, and when necessary, speak truth to power. In Singapore, plays that deal with ethnicity or race and religion, politics, sexuality, or any kind of um, retelling of a history apart from the official narrative is viewed with suspicion. And I can understand why, because in today's world, it's exactly the same thing that we are experiencing. Issues surrounding race and religion, politics, and in your case, marriage equality at this moment in time, have become very, very divisive and polarizing. So we are either moved to anger or we are paralyzed by fear when it comes to thinking and talking about them. We need new ways of seeing and thinking, but how do we go about it and what is the theater's role in doing that? In the absence of a free and independent press, the Singapore theater me and my colleagues in the Singapore Theatre have assumed the mantle of the fourth estate and some would also say the fifth. We have tried through our work to create a space for alternative discourse and thoughtful dissent. I don't have uh, time to go into all the work that we've done um, and maybe we can chat about it in our breakout session later, but Hotel, which was here at the Oz Asia Festival, um, is one example which, you know, it reclaimed the official narrative uh, and extended our history to not a, just a hundred year, uh, not just a 50 year history, which the, you know, authorities want us to talk about because it kind of tells the story of how we rose from mud flat to metropolis in 50 years, but actually tells the story of a rich and beautiful and engaged in cosmopolitan Singapore that has been around for a 100, 100 years and actually beyond. In telling these stories, we challenge the existing notions of race, identity, gender and sexual orientation, and the chasm between the haves and the have-nots, uh, between privilege and servitude. And the work asked in the end what, uh, you know, at its core, the, uh, the work really asks, what kind of society do we want to have? Do we want to have a, a society which is open to new people and new ideas? Do we, how do we actually manage our diversity beyond our borders, but also within our borders? And it also basically asked, what is our role as global citizens in this whole scheme of things? And um, I just want to say thank you to Oz Asia, Joe Mitchell and the entire team for, for, for giving us this opportunity to share this work with you because it affirmed for us that this play, this production was not just a Singapore production but, but something that really tapped into uh, the zeitgeist. I'm often asked if we consider theatre as a kind of public forum to discuss contentious issues, then why not just hold forums like this one? Why use the theatre as a vehicle for debate? Except that there is much more than a debate that happens when these issues are aired in the theatre. For one thing, in the theatre, the opposing viewpoints are embodied. 
They are not merely abstract arguments that are communicated in an essay, an article, or a comments thread on Facebook. These are arguments that actually move bodies, sometimes to the point of violence, but also sometimes to a moment of reconciliation and healing. And there is no equivalent of a physical embrace in our logocentric world. This kind of strategy or resolution is available only to bodies occupying shared space and time. And theatre happens when a group of people, the artists, comes together with another group of people, the audience, and together we enrich the experience of being human. The second thing that the theatre offers is not just a character's worldview, but the very world that has given rise to those views. This allows us to appreciate the complexities and the nuances behind the viewpoints that we might otherwise dismiss as bizarre, unsophisticated or ridiculous. The third thing is that in an age of rising populist sentiment of Brexit as well as Trump, we are beginning to realize that very often what wins the debate is not only the strength of our argument, but also the strength of our convictions. I think for a long time we have placed too much of a premium on the rational in governing our interactions with one another. But this faith in the rational is in itself a kind of irrational faith, a blind utopianism, because we cannot remove aspects of the effective and the emotional from our lives. So I think that the theatre is well placed as a site where we can reckon with these forces that has led to this current age of anger. To borrow a term coined by the writer Pankaj Mishra. As Mishra himself noted, no account of our current moment in history is complete without also tracking dimensions such as hopelessness, humiliation, and resentment, what he calls the wars of the inner world. If anything, theatre encourages us to walk in another's shoes, to imagine possibilities beyond our own biases and our prejudices, giving us clues as to how we can get on with the great art of living with one another. And it's about time. Thank you.